While they were assembling, I'd like to make a few comments about uh, safety committees at racetracks, which is what, uh, what the subject of this panel is. And uh, as I said this morning, we were very aware of not coming up with uh, ideas that cost people a lot of money or cost racetracks a lot of money. And uh, uh, I think this is, a, this is a very good example of improvement without cost. Okay, to moderate this panel, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mike Ziegler, who is Executive Director uh, and the TR NTRA Safety and Integrity Alliance. As you know, that alliance has been uh, a real boon to this summit in, uh, in the terms of how they have uh, given a seal of approval to some of the ideas we've had. And uh, Mr. Ziegler. Thanks, Ed, and I'd also like to thank everybody who's worked so hard putting on this conference. Um, a lot of good things come out of the Welfare and Safety Summit every other year, and we look forward to implementing some of the new ideas out of here at the Safety and Integrity Alliance. It's my pleasure to introduce this panel discussion on track safety committees. Uh, simply put, the act of being prepared for and cognizant of safety issues and regularly discussing them and addressing them is a really simple way to help protect the human and equine athletes at our tracks. At the Safety and Integrity Alliance, we felt that the safety committee was such an important step in conducting safe racing that we added it as a requirement to our standards. And for your information, a copy of the Alliance accreditation standards are in the packet, as well as a map showing the tracks around the country that are currently accredited. So here's what we require from a safety committee. Um, track members shall establish a standing racetrack safety committee. Safety committee shall include but not be limited to representatives of the following stakeholder groups. Track management, track medical personnel, jockeys, horsemen, veterinarians, and security. Committees shall meet regularly upon commencement of a member's race meet and as necessary thereafter. So we've got a great panel with us today and each of these panelists has a unique approach to the concept of safety committee which we have considered a best practice which we should share as we go around the country. So to get started, I'm gonna introduce Roy Rowanbeck who is from Golden Gate Fields. He is uh, environmental health and safety director there. And Golden Gate Fields has a great practice where they discuss near misses. So Roy, come on up. Thanks Mike, I appreciate it. And uh, don't try to email me at that because he spelled my name wrong. Again, I'm Roy Rowanbeck. I'm from uh, uh, Golden Gate Fields in Berkeley, and just an aerial overview of our track out there. We're an NTRA uh, accredited track. Uh, we're about 130 acres, uh, about 1,300 horses on site, and about 300 uh, employees. And again, we race uh, year-round about 10 months a year, so we have a pretty active uh, race schedule uh, that's on that. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, near-miss incidents and accidents. Again, I'm focusing on human safety. So we're looking at the aspects of your injury and accident reporting program at your facility, again, relating to human incidents or accidents. A near-miss is defined as an incident or an accident uh, involving an employee, again, not patrons because that fall under the GL. This is workers' compensation. Uh, that an incident or an accident involving an employee that does not result in medical attention. So again, it's, it's something that needs to be reported. And again, I presume that all tracks would have some type of health and safety program with a component for injury and, and uh, accident reporting. It's a workers' compensation. I do insurance at our, at our uh, facility as well, and in California, workers' compensation is fairly expensive. Our premiums are over... Um, over seven figures a year. That's just for workers' compensation. It's exclusive of our GL. So it's in our benefit to have a, a near-miss program, a uh, fairly aggressive uh, uh, accident injury reporting program. So I imagine all tracks have a similar one again as well. But uh, when you're paying over a million dollars in workers' compensation programs, you're going to have loss control, people coming out. You're going to have your 
uh, representatives from your workers' compensation uh, insurance company coming out. They're going to want to see what you have, how you document it. So again, we defined what a near-miss incident or accident is, and uh, essentially it's for employee close calls. Uh, and again, it's, it's, these are uh, incidents where you can really learn a lot from. It's a close call. Someone fell down, but they don't need medical attention. They were involved in an accident. Uh, some other type of incident or, or there was a triggering aspect to it, again, underlying health and safety. Uh, uh, but these are non-workers' compensation reported uh, incidents on that. So uh, basically, it, it, uh, as Mike had mentioned, uh, these are aspects of a health and safety program that shouldn't cost you anything extra. It's, they're not labor intensive. They should just be elemental and part of any, uh, they're a part of almost any industry. Uh, racetracks are a little bit uh, uh, less progressive, so to speak, uh, in their health and safety programs as we've seen, but uh, involving uh, uh, employees. So we, we're looking to incorporate this again as part of your injury and accident uh, reporting program. Um, you basically, if something happens, an employee is involved in a close call, an incident, or an accident, uh, he or she reports it on an employee accident report form, and we'll see one in a second that's on there. And again, that's a form you'd already have, because that's a form that's required under workers' compensation. If someone's injured and needs uh, medical attention, they're going to have to fill out an employee accident report form. Again, so there's no redundancy, no extra labor uh, on that. It's just, uh, what's unique to this is, it's filled out by the employee in the presence of his supervisor or manager as soon as possible. You want to have it filled out in real time, and we'll go to the reason, uh, the reasoning behind this uh, that's on there. But we encourage uh, real-time reporting, especially uh, if, if there's no medical attention required, uh, the underlying cause needs to be addressed or uh, and so on. So again, it needs to be filled out uh, as quickly as possible, and it should make it easy for each department. Again, it's one form, and they fill it out. Your insurance company is going to love it. Your corporate owner, if you have one, is going to love it as well, and it really formalizes it with your employees. So the form basically just includes an accident uh, incident description, as well as the causation. Uh, so I fell down. There was a uh, why'd you fall down? There was a power cord. Uh, across the aisle in the turf club and the means for future prevention. Cord should go above. Pretty elemental, pretty simple, but again, it goes a long way towards keeping your, your workers' compensation and your future uh, 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 health and safety costs down as well. Now, the key to the, the difference between a normal a uh, employee accident report form and including an element for a near-miss incident or accident is having a waiver of medical treatment clause in it. Again, the employee just writes down what happened to him, he fell down, why he fell down, uh, how it can be avoided in the future. He signs off uh, verifying uh, the accuracy of the information he provided. Again, uh, workers' compensation fraud is a, is, is a big issue, and it certainly is, is, is factored in all your premiums on that. But having a waiver of medical treatment clause preserves the employee's right for future treatment down the line. So again, it protects the employee uh, it protects the employee so that he can get uh, uh, treatment down the line if the condition aggravates. A lot of times, and, and it protects the employer as well. If a person falls down and it's not deemed a serious uh, accident at that time, not requiring medical treatment, perhaps uh, he hurt his knee and adrenaline kicked in, he's walking it off, he feels all right, he goes home that night. Uh, and his knee is swelled up, he comes in the next day and says, you know, hey, uh, I need to get medical treatment, I had an injury on the job, and now it's actually more than a near miss. So the, the waiver of medical uh, treatment does not preclude him or her from getting treatment down the line, but it's, but it's pretty important. So again, one form, not hard to do. It's the human side of, 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 of health and safety. It's tied in with your workers' compensation programs, and um, it should be, again, pretty elemental. This right here is a copy of, the, uh, of our uh, Golden Gate Fields Employee Accident uh, Report form. It's in English and in Spanish. You can get it translated in the only language that you need. Again, pretty elemental. The employee fills it out, fills it out in real time, fills it out in the presence of his, his manager or his supervisor, witnesses, uh, so on as that. But again, it's already part of your workers' compensation injury reporting, so again, no added labor on that. Uh, I can see you're moving the, uh, quickly uh, on that. So. Uh, Go, you can go ahead to the last slide. So to sum it up, again, we're talking again the value of a near-miss program. And you can sum it up basically in, in, in four, uh, uh, just, just four benefits to it. 
One is that it serves as a warning of potential future repeat incidents. Again, it's, it, it can trigger work orders to mitigate the underlying risk or hazard. This happens all the time. A person falls down, person uses a broken ladder, person uh, traverses an active uh, causeway where there's traffic and whatever, if there's an incident or accident, it allows uh, the facility to review the underlying cause. Again, so it's the ounce of prevention uh, aspect to it. I'm gonna give two examples for the following uh, benefits. It documents, this is uh, bullet point number two, it documents the particulars of an incident or an accident in case of a later injury detail discrepancy. Now this uh, benefits both the employer and the employee. This puts a placeholder in. The insurance company is going to want to see this. If a person is injured and doesn't report that injury for two weeks later, your workers' comp insurer is going to say, you know, good luck, you're on your own paying that out of pocket because we don't know that happened at work. So it behooves the employee to fill out a near miss form to preserve his right for medical treatment down should the, uh, should the, uh, should the uh, condition uh, aggravate. Now again, it also helps the employer, uh, uh, the track itself, because a lot of times there's discrepancies. We've had employees fill out a near miss form and say that they hurt their left arm uh, moving, uh, uh, some lumber or material on there, and they fill out on your missing that your left arm is sore and such as that. They come back a month later and saying, you know, I need medical attention uh, because my right arm, you know, is really hurting. And we go back and we wave it and we say, well, actually, the injury was to your other arm. So uh, it, it can it can invalidate. Uh, instances of, of, of fraudulent injury or people that are injured outside of work that are trying to uh, get it covered under workers' compensation, but it can also uh, preserve, again, for the employee so that there's no hassle, and that's the third one, a place, uh, uh, provides a placeholder for any future workers' compensation claims uh, down that. Now, we had an assistant starter that was injured uh, on the track, filled out a near miss, about six months later came back, turned, he had a, uh, he had a torn uh, rotator cuff. So for about six months, he was working with a torn rotator cuff. Now, our workers' compensation uh, insurer was saying, well, you worked at Golden Gate Fields, you went on to county fairs, you went down to Southern California on the circuit. How do we know it happened at this track, and why, do we, and why should we get stuck with the bill for doing this? Well, he filled out a near-miss form. He did what he needed to do, took a few minutes, placeholder in there, provided to the workers' compensation, and the claim went through. Had he not done that, it would have been, uh, the claim would have been investigated, might have been held up, might have been rejected again. So uh, behooves both the employee and the employer. Now, the last aspect of having a near-miss program uh, uh, is, again, that it serves to formalize the on-site uh, workers' compensation accident re uh, reporting investigation. It's a way to track incidents and forums. It can be used interdepartmentally. If you work, if your employee is working on the track, maybe he's a valet and he's in the uh, racing department. He trips on uh, an edging on the track. Uh, it's going to be the maintenance department that repairs it. He fills out a near miss. That form can be, can be used as a work order for maintenance or any other department to mitigate the underlying hazard. Again, simple tool, elemental in, in, most, uh, in most industries. We'd like to see it used at all tracks and incorporated into your uh, injury and accident reporting. And I think your, your workers' compensation uh, insurers would be happy as a clam if you, if you had a few of these on file as well when they come out and do their loss control audit. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Uh, next, I'd like to bring up John Wayne, who is executive director of the Delaware Thoroughbred Racing Commission, and he's going to talk about the Delaware approach to safety committees. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. I represent the uh, Delaware Thoroughbred Racing Commission uh, at Delaware Park. That's our only thoroughbred racetrack. Uh, formerly had uh, harness responsibility at uh, Dover Downs and Harrington Raceway, but on October the 15th of 2005, Mr. Hugh Gallagher took the reins of harness racing. Actually, it was 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> the safety committee meeting that we have at Delaware Park, I don't know if it's unique or not, but it's certainly uh, it's a very uh, good interaction between department managers, uh, people that are involved in horse racing at, at uh, Delaware Park. It consists of a director of racing, the vice president and general counsel of racing, two jockeys usually, a jockey guild representative, a Delaware Jockeys Association representative. We have a commission veterinarian. 
We have a commission steward. All three stewards in Delaware are commission stewards. So we have one of those stewards, the tracks director of security, and the emergency medical services director, which is under the risk management department, as well as, as myself, the uh, commission's executive director. And the most important thing is that we get together and we talk. And we talk about putting ideas into action. It's great to have a meeting and then everyone forgets what we discussed. We try not to do that. We try to take notes and we try to implement recommendations that make sense. Uh, just recently we had a meeting with the Christiana Hospital uh, medical director. And uh, that is a trauma one center, a level trauma one level uh, trauma center uh, right across the street from the racetrack about maybe five and a half minutes drive. And we talked about assessing injuries, that when we have a rider that hits the track, that it's much like a motorcyclist being thrown from a motorcycle. So it immediately gets put on a fast track. And I think sometimes the EMTs that we have at the racetrack are supposed to notify the hospital in advance, but sometimes that might get uh, forgotten because in, in the haste of trying to get the rider over to the uh, emergency room. But we, we talked about opening those lines of communication and that we're going to fast track jockeys. Now, we brought four videos with us and we showed them and it seems like they had never seen a racing accident and it really hit home with them. Uh, we had four accidents that had occurred at Delaware Park over the last several years. <clears throat> One of them, were, which I think really affected them the most, was a, a jockey that pancaked on the racetrack and the horse rolled over on him and pretty much collapsed his one side of his face. So that, that rider is not back to racing. Um, his injuries were so severe, uh, he's lucky, uh, he lost the eye, uh, but he's lucky he's still alive. And what we're going to do is uh, make a video record of each of these spills, and it's gonna be available to the hospital so that medical staff can look at the, the video well after the fact. I mean, after they've addressed the, the, uh, the injuries that they uh, initially see, but to look at the video and to see what else this jockey might have uh, sustained. And I think that'll be very helpful. They were very, very uh, receptive to this information and uh, gratified that somebody cares about, uh, you know, uh, following through and to making sure that the, the jockeys are well cared for. Uh, another example of putting ideas into action is our track warning system. I believe there's, a, there's information in your packets. And, uh, and it really, it's a, it's a diagram. It gives you a, a cost analysis of what it, what it takes to put in this track warning system. Uh, warning systems are only good if you use them. So um, I know there was a recent incident uh, up in Indiana and uh, I was horrified to see that. I'm sure Joe was too. But they have a, a track warning system installed at their racetrack. So it's very important that when you install these things that people know how to use them and, and that the riders are well rehearsed uh, how to react when something like that happens, when you have an accident on the racetrack. And so we've been very, very fortunate uh, to not have any repeat instances of horses running into one another or any other kind of an accident that could be avoided. Uh, our commission is also involved with the International Conference of Health, Safety, and Welfare of Jockeys. And we just had a uh, safety meeting up at the Monmouth Park. Uh, there were 14 countries represented. And we thought it was very, very important uh, for, you know, regulators to be at that meeting. Um, we sponsor a nutrition program. Our professor, Dr. Sue Snyder, from the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension was at that conference. Uh, she feels that it's an important thing. Jockey nutrition can also be associated with safety because riders that make healthy choices and are not dehydrated uh, and uh, have low blood sugar fall off a horse and then create a, a hazard for, for themselves and other riders. So we think it's very important that our commission sponsors a nutritional seminar and we've had two so far, 
and it's designed for riders and their spouses to make healthy choices in their diets and avoid empty calories. And we have these little workshops that we do and they have the cards and you have to pick nutritional items and then you say, what's your score? And then we give away prizes for those that make uh, healthy choices. Uh, the program is under the direction of the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension and headed by Dr. Sue Snyder. We also, we also did a program last year that was really well received and that was involving safety helmets and safety vests. Now, Commission implemented a one-time stipend up to $600 per rider towards the purchase of a safety vest and helmet. And the program took off with great enthusiasm in rebating approximately $20,000 to participating riders. And I think the jockeys that ride at Delaware Park were very appreciative of that. And they wrote a letter to the Commission about how it helped them uh, to see that there's a governing body there that really does care that we're just not worried about money coming in. It's just that we're, we're also concerned about giving back to the industry. So if you have any questions for me, I, I would like to say thank you to Keeneland and to the Jockey Club for hosting this uh, event here. I spent many of my formative years at Keeneland from uh, 1982 to 1987. And I was fortunate enough to be here when Queen Elizabeth visited uh, Keeneland for the Queen's Challenge Cup. And uh, it's a wonderful place. It's, uh, it's always great coming back here. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. It's great to hear how Delaware is implementing what they're actually talking about. Um, I'd like to next bring up Chip, Chip Bach, who is the Director of Operations from Turfway Park. And he's going to present on postmortem accident investigation. Hi, I'm Chip. I'm from Turfway, just up the road. Um, Mike had asked me, we, we, um, we were under a lot of scrutiny a couple of years ago when we had a rash of uh, catastrophic breakdowns. Fortunately, on Polytrack, we, don't, uh, we have a very low breakdown rate. I, I believe we've run this year maybe 5,000 starters, and we've had one breakdown so far this year uh, in January. So we're very fortunate with the low occurrences of breakdowns we have, but we have had in 2004 a jockey who was killed on the racetrack. Um, and because we were under the microscope, we wanted to make sure we did everything possible uh, to explain control, uh, you know, control communication, explain what's going on and understand what's going on to find out if there wasn't a problem uh, with the racetrack, which is typically uh, the first thing the riders were saying and the, and the trainers were saying, oh, this new poly track, there's a problem with the back turn or there's a low spot or whatever. So what we do is we, um, in the event that there's an, uh, an accident on the track, now we have had two what we call suicides on the track, two with uh, horses, one who flipped in the gate and was unfortunately had to be destroyed, as well as another one in the paddock uh, who, who flipped and hit, hit her head very hard and had to be destroyed. But uh, we don't use the same protocol for those horses as we do for horses that are running. Uh, what we do is uh, once we, we are aware of, of an accident, obviously we let the medical people take care of the situation. Uh, I go to the video room, I, I observe uh, the race on replay. If it's, um, uh, we don't replay them to the public if they're graphic. Um, we'll get a video record of, of the race. Uh, part of our protocol is to talk to the jockey if the jockey's available talk to the trainer, uh, we'll, we'll ask the jockey questions like, uh, you know, what did you feel when, when it was happening? W were there any problems with the horse uh, prior to the race? Those types of questions. Uh, we'll talk to the trainer about any pre-existing injuries. We'll, we'll print off uh, a PP of the horse to see if there's anything that that would tell us that would lead us to believe that, you know, if they drop it down in class severely or if it's coming off a long layoff, if there might have been a pre-existing problem with the horse. And then we map out on the track where it happened. And in the, in the case where we've had a couple incidents in the same area of the track, our track uh, superintendent is engaged at the same time. He'll do depth analysis of the racetrack. He'll, make a, he'll immediately make uh, physical observations of any, any area that um, a catastrophic injury occurs to make sure that there's no evidence, uh, visible evidence of why or what might have, ha might have happened. And then we uh, accumulate our information uh, 
in that manner. Uh, we have it available for the state if they need it. We talk to the uh, state veterinarians as soon as they're finished attending to the horse to tell us what they know and we incorporate all this into our catastrophic breakdown report. Uh, if we do see if um, uh, this bl uh, blends into our uh, safety committee, our safety committee is a cross-functional group of people, uh, including the track superintendent and our outriders, and once a month we, we have a meeting with those folks. We talk about what happened on the racetrack. Some of the, some of the feedback we get, unfortunately, you know, the rider will say, I don't know, he was going great, and, and I just heard a snap, right? We'll talk to the riders around that horse, and they'll say, I wasn't really, I, I really couldn't tell you what happened. And sometimes the trainers will tell you, well, that's racing. So unfortunately, the base of information that we get is very limited. We, the, the best information we get are from our state vets, and they tell us what happened, and uh, they can't tell us why it happened. Each horse is then shipped to Lexington for a necropsy. Um, but to the extent of our record keeping, uh, we feel that it's important for us to know exactly where accidents happen, happen on the track and if there's anything we can do in a, pre in a preventative way uh, to, to address our racetrack. So uh, that's our catastrophic breakdown process. Uh, a couple, our safety committee is really um, designed probably like most other safety committees. You know, we, we uh, plan, we write our protocols, we identify ident uh, things that we feel um, our team will have to address over the course of a year. We practice, you know, we train, we, we take these protocols, we make sure everybody has the, the tools and the knowledge on how to execute them. And then, we, um, then we're prepared, I, would, I believe, for uh, any number of unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we were one of the first tracks, I believe, that had to deal with the um, equine herpes uh, problem, where we had this viral disease that was deadly to horses. Um, so what, nobody had uh, protocols for those, that type of issue. So we wrote them down. We wrote down everything we did. We made sure that we checked with, checked with the Gluck and, and Rudin Riddle and everybody, any, anybody that would tell us, give us guidance on how to do what we were doing. And the consequence, if we weren't managing the quarantine barn properly, the, states, the state veterinarian would have shut our whole barn area down. At the same time, um, this was about a week before our our grade three spiral stakes, and we were trying to attract, you know, million dollar horses onto the grounds while we had this horrible uh, epidemic going on. So we had to demonstrate to the trainers and the owners that we were handling ourselves properly. And again, I believe it was due to the training, it was due to the, uh, the response and the training of our people that we held our races successfully. Um, the quarantine barn eventually became, uh, you know, the horses passed their, their test and uh, we went about our business. But uh, Things like that, uh, as it relates to safety committee, it's so important, and you'll see, and I'm sure you all know, there are so many people, uh, once an accident happens, and if you're not diligent and you're not disciplined in keeping your records up to date, keeping your safety committee meeting, uh, going on a monthly basis or, or how, whatever the frequency is for you all, and reacting to those things that you find to be problems, uh, how horribly they can haunt you <laughs> later after a problem occurs. And you know, hindsight's 2020, and there's a lot of hindsight once an accident occurs. So um, if there's anything I can uh, impart as it relates to the safety committee, it's keep them, keep it going, keep it active, and, uh, and, and maintain the discipline for incident reports. I know a lot, some of the folks here were talking about their incident reports, making sure those incident reports hit on a timely basis, and that when problems are observed, uh, that they're dealt with immediately. And so I, I believe that's all I have. Thank you, Chip. And uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jerry Pack, who's the Association Veterinarian from the Hollywood Casino at Penn National. And he oversees a different sort of an injury investigation program that I think gets a little more into the veterinary aspects of the situation. Thank you, Mike, and I would uh, like to thank the organizing party for inviting me here today. I don't know whether this was planned for me to be last. As the day has progressed, we have all seen that we are concerned about the welfare of the horse. I am concerned of what happened after that horse went down. And in, in the mid-Atlantic state, the first thing you will hear out of a trainer's mouth of a after a catastrophic injury is Doc, that's the soundest horse I have in the barn. Doc, he don't have a dimple on him. 
And, you know, I'm thinking, my God, if this is the soundest horse you've got in your barn, we're in trouble. So what has happened at Penn National? In 1997, the Department of Agriculture opened the Diagnostic Lab in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is about 15 miles from our racetrack at Penn National. So in 2010, Hollywood Casino Management decided that we were going to do catastrophic injury reviews with the trainers. Now, in the state of Pennsylvania, all veterinarians that work on the backside have to turn in a treatment sheet within 24 hours to the commission, which we have access to. All catastrophic injuries that occur during live racing are taken to our diagnostic laboratory and necropsies are performed. Since uh, 1997, I think we have done a little over 500 necropsies. We have set up a review committee that consists of the vice president of racing, the racing secretary, and myself. The three of us all attend our review. On some occasions, the Stewart's, the commission veterinarian, the HBPA uh, representative, the jockey, and the veterinarian will attend the meetings. If it's a shipping uh, trainer, we will conduct a conference call. So we put out together some questions that we'd like to ask everyone. Uh, these will be in your folder. I will go through them a little bit because there's something that we are looking for that you might not think about. So if one of the first things we asked these trainers is was this horse sound and were there any issues? And of course, we will get anything from he was perfectly sound to yeah, doc, he had some problems. We didn't think they were major. The other thing we'd like to know is, did they saddle that horse that night? Were you in that paddy? And was there a change in that horse's attitude? Some of them know, some of them don't know. Horses are not stupid. They will tell you when things change. And one of the first places they will tell you that they're changing is in the saddling paddock when you can't get a saddle on them. The other question I want to know is, was he on the vet's list or was he on the starter's list? Lo and behold, once again, the starter's list usually tells us very early that we may be looking at a problem. And with Encompass out now and everybody entering their information, the veterinarian, the starter, and the paddock judge, you can follow the career of this horse. So I want to know, have we had this problem? And do you know that we have this problem? We want to know who does their veterinarian work. We want to know, was there any pre-race medication given to this horse? And if so, who give it? And what did they give? And when did they give it? Had any joints been injected on this horse while they'd had him under their training care? And if so, why were they injected? Was there a diagnosis that indicated that they need to be injected? Had the horse been x-rayed? And if he'd been x-rayed, what was the diagnosis? This is my best this one really irritates me the most. I practiced 19 years on the backside of a racetrack. I've been with the Racing Commission and Penn National for about 17 years now. Do you train on Butte and do you train on Clenbuterol? And they can tell me that he's sound, but when they tell me that they train on Butte every day, something's not right. And when they tell me that they train on Clenbuterol twice a day, every day, come on guys. Just had a review the other night that guys, I said, do you train on clenbuterol? Yeah, three and a half cc's twice a day. And I said, why do you train on that? He said, for the respiratory problems. I said, respiratory problems? After about 10 days to two weeks, you lose the effect of your clenbuterol. So you're not training on it for the effects of the bronchial dilation or the mucolytic. You're training on it for anabolic effects. Oh, no, no, doc. I've been doing it for 10 years and everybody else does it. Had the horse been shockwaved? In the state of Pennsylvania, shockwave, a horse that's shockwaved goes on the vet's list for seven days and cannot run till the eighth day. Had the horse had an endoscopic examination? If so, was there a diagnosis? How long had this trainer trained this horse? And had the horse been off the racetrack for an extended layup? Or had he been off the racetrack to go to another veterinary facility? What's their normal vaccination program? 
I want to know what the susceptibility is of my population on the backside of my racetrack. If I have a flu hit, am I in trouble? If I have a West Niles hit, am I in trouble? If I have a rabies problem, are we in trouble? Amazing, the trainers at our facility, very few vaccinate their horses. And the last question I asked them is, what is their thoughts on our racetrack? We want to be upfront and honest with the trainer, and we expect them to be the same with us. We have an open door policy. If there is an issue, we want to know it. I think I'm very fortunate because I work for an organization that feels that way. I've been at other places where it doesn't work that way. But Penn National absolutely wants to know what's going on. So after they tell us what they think of our racetrack, we tell them what we found on our necropsy and ask them if they are aware of what's going on. As Dr. Stover and Dr. Arthur has talked earlier, as I can tell you with over 500, very rarely do we find a horse that there is not some pathological changes in this horse at some point. We had a two-year-old first-time starter a couple years ago that you could have written a pathology book on. There was 10 joints in this horse that were affected. The trainer said, absolutely, Doc, he doesn't have a problem. So what has this done for us? Our review process, we don't know how it's going to work short term. We certainly have feel that the awareness of the trainers know that we are concerned and that we are going to monitor what goes on. There are a couple of things that happened in the state of Pennsylvania that we think have helped our catastrophic injuries. In uh, 2008, we did ban anabolic steroids. And in 2009, there were strict guidelines set forth for the intraarticular injection of corticosteroids. One of the things that has really surprised us as we have gone through this process over the last two years is the positive response that we have gotten from trainers and not just our trainers at Penn National, but trainers from numerous racetracks. And their comment has been, Doc, why is this not done at other racetracks? We appreciate what you do with this because now we know, well, maybe that's why that horse didn't want to run. And maybe he was telling me, and maybe I need to pay more attention. Short-term evaluation can be misleading as we know but what we do find that since we started this in January of 2010, our catastrophic injury rate has dropped about 25%. And the last two years in 2010 and 2011 has been the lowest catastrophic rate that we have had since the numbers, we started collecting the numbers in 1996. Penn National operates 10 racetracks. Four other racetracks other than Penn, Nash, uh, Penn National Hollywood Casino at Penn National are thoroughbred and quarter horse tracks. We feel that this is beneficial to us. Now, necropsies are not available at the other four of our racetracks, but we feel the process of asking questions is important. And we are instituting this program and this protocol at our other four racetracks as they open their new sessions this year. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for any of the panelists? I, I think other than that. Yes. No. Um, the uh, commission in 97, when they opened the diagnostic lab, since the racing commission is under the Department of Agriculture, it was kind of a, a done deal that they would necropsy the horses for the racing commission. So the racing commission kind of picks a tab up, Penn National picks a tab up for the horses to be transported to the laboratory. That's how it works in Kentucky. That's the same thing, we do the same thing. We pay for the necropsy. The track provides for the transportation. Any other questions? 
I have a question for, uh, oh, excuse me, go ahead. would like to know is what was the pathology in this floor? Was there some, some reason that led to the catastrophic injury that this trainer should have been aware of? Now, understand we do not point fingers. We use this as an education for both the trainers and for us. Uh, and, and it has been very, very beneficial because the trainers now know that we're watching and they don't like to talk to us. We have used this, we have not put any trainers off the racetrack or anything based on what we have found with our reports. However, it has been utilized in allocating stalls. If we have a trainer that we think is not paying attention to what's going on, and we've had a couple of catastrophic injuries, that may come into effect when we allocate stalls to him for the next year. don't have a safety committee at this time. No. Well, we hear from our executive director for the Delaware Thurman Horseman Association, and uh, I, I failed to put her on that uh, list of personnel, but she's on that safety committee along with us. Well, I was going to ask uh, at uh, Penn National, uh, these interviews you have, do you have a sense that that has uh, change people's perceptions about pre-race exams? Are they, are, are trainers more attuned to the advantage of that and have the pre-race exams uh, reflected the input that you get from these incidents? I, I think the two have worked together. Uh, as we have addressed earlier today that, you know, there has been an issue about whether we were really looking at the horse in the morning that we're gonna be looking at at night because of the medication. Uh, but I think that the pre-race inspections and the catastrophic injury review has come together. We, we do seem to see some correlation with maybe something they have seen in the morning and then we see a catastrophic injury maybe later. But, yes. Uh, and I think to answer your question about the vibrancy of racing, uh, the safety committee definitely helps. I mean, as, as you can understand what's going on, there's a lot of rumors that start when something bad happens. It could damage horse racing uh, pretty quickly. And um, I think getting, making sure people are confident with what you're doing, the information they're getting from you is accurate, and you can get out there in front of it quickly will dissuade people from saying, you know, the, the race, uh, the industry is unsafe or this particular racetrack's unsafe. So I think it goes a great it goes a, a great uh, way in helping the industry, being prepared and being able to answer things. And if there's a problem, oh, candidly saying, we found a problem when we fixed it. Other questions? Okay, thank you so much for your attendance today. We will start again at 8.30 tomorrow. Thank you, Mike, and thanks again to your, the panel, and uh, we'll see you in the morning.